Welcome to the Become Revolutionary show, where we talk to you about how to get over those hurdles to become revolutionary in life and business. We're your hosts, Noelle and Charlene, and today we'll be talking about finding and stepping into your purpose. That's right. And today we are blessed and honored to have Kent Weed on the show with us to share his experience of overcoming adversity and life and business uh, to bring him to where he is today. So super excited for this conversation. Uh, Kent is the creator and executive producer of the five-time Emmy non uh, nominated hit television series, American Ninja Warrior. Woo, that was a tongue twister for me. <laughs> need more coffee. His career spans three decades and he's produced over 250 shows for 45 different networks. Hit shows like Hell's Kitchen, The Swan, Skating with Celebrities, Kitchen Nightmares, and the World Music Awards. 10 years after starting his own production company in 2001, he and his partner sold it for $100 million. He then spent the next 10 years studying and learning mindfulness and meditation, Qigong, and biohacking his body for health and longevity, all while being a dedicated husband and dad to his three amazing kids. He launched LiveYourPurpose.com in 2020 to share his story and to help others. In December 2021, he debuted his meditation and mindfulness course, called Taming Your Monkey Mind to help people who struggle with stress, anxiety, and sleep. Uh, almost every entrepreneur, I just got to say. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's also a mindvalley.com master certified trainer, giving trainings on becoming extraordinary. And wow, are we ever in for a treat today, friends. So welcome, Kent. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Noel. I really appreciate being here with you guys. This is very exciting for me. Oh, great. Well, we, we are honored that you've taken the time to talk to us today, Kent. And so I can imagine, like as Charlene was reading your bio, so I'm just going to start right there with the question that came up for me as she was reading your bio. I can imagine working in the production of all of these television shows and the networks there's probably a fair amount of fast paced stress that you've experienced in your life. <laughs> um, and so it would make sense to me that after all of those years, you're like, okay, what's next? Or there's more. And we would really love to talk to you about that sort of journey today. And so why don't you take us back, take us back to the beginning? Like, how did you get into television? What was that like? And what, and what was that process for you and the feelings attached to it? Yeah, well, uh, when I was in my early 20s, I got into television. I was a, a production assistant. I started at the bottom, worked my way up. I was, you know, the guy that made coffees and ran errands and wow. and um, made, got your coffee for you. And and um, and I just, you know, kind of felt from the beginning, you know, I had this mentality or mindset from my parents, from my dad my, primarily that said, you know, whatever you do in your life, do your best. Always do your best. I don't care if you dig ditches, you know, wherever. So mm -hmm. I had that kind of mentality from from, from a young age. Mm -hmm. And so I made sure that when I made the Xerox copies, they were perfect and the coffee was exactly the way they wanted it. And that, that kind of mindset and attention to detail really paid off and, and helped me move up the ladder rather quickly. By, you know, mm -hmm. 27, I was directing primetime network television shows. Wow. So it was, um, it was pretty exciting and I was, you know, caught up in the, all the whirlwind of it and the fast paced, you know, this of the, of the, of the industry and, and, you know, to be young and making good money was, was exciting. Um, I had went my first before I was directing, I was an AD assistant director and I wanted to transition to directing. And the, most people were, you know, taking little directing jobs as they stayed as an AD, but I realized that no one would accept me as a director until I was a director myself. And so I mm. quit. I said, I don't AD anymore. Mm. And the first year my, my income went down, you know, by like five fold. I've made like $30,000 as a director yeah. by three, three years later, I was making 300,000. So, but I committed to, to what I wanted to do and made the decision to do it and was willing to suffer, if you call it suffering, or to go through the, the, the growing pains or the, you know, to get that acceptance. Mm -hmm. Directing was really my passion and I found my passion by, by a chance, uh, I'm a very visual person and I see things in pictures. So, uh, but you know, it, it's a, it's a tough business, like you said, full of stress, full of lots of anxiety and, you know, pressure. 
And, and I wasn't um, fully equipped to deal with that pressure at that age. Uh, I had had some, some training earlier on about mindfulness and uh, my go-to books were the, the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman and Seven Spiritual Laws of Success by Deepak Chopra. Those are like the two mm. main books I had on my shelf that helped me get through those early years. Yeah. But um, I gradually just grew into directing and producing the shows I was directing. Mm. But, uh, you know, along the way that, that came with some, some prices to pay. So, so, you know, I was living the fast life and partying a lot and, you know, drinking a lot. And I got into drugs sometimes for a short period of my 20s. And, and so I got caught up in that whole world and kind of lost my focus in my, my, on what the spiritual side of me was about. And I really believe that, you know, in a, a lot of our careers, especially entrepreneurs, especially people that are, you know, striving to, to, to make it big and be successful, yeah. that all of their focus and attention goes towards that. And what I realized, um, after starting my company in 2000 and growing it and creating all these shows and producing and directing all these shows is that you can't have, you have to have balance in your life mm -hmm. and, and you have to establish priorities, uh, to create that balance. And so as of my search after I sold my company in 2011 was about really kind of going back and finding what, what my purpose was and what am I here for? How do I find that balance? How do I create balance in my life? So that I'm happy and still be successful, still be on the cutting edge of and and you know of, of technology, of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and and grow in, in in every area of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I basically created a list of priorities of my life, and said, well, the first thing if I want to be successful is I want to be healthy, you know, mm -hmm. and the second thing is my my family. So I, those are the two most important things in my life, and then work comes in third or fourth. And if I dedicate my days and it's as simple as just dedicating a day and focus on the priority. So whatever happens to you in your environment, in your situation, and you, you, you attach, attack it from the point of view of okay, what's my priority here. Mm -hmm. So if something comes up and, and it's going to interrupt my workout or it's going to interrupt something that's going to keep me healthy, then mm -hmm. that's going to go against my priority list or something. My kids need me for something and I'm in the middle of writing an email about work. I have to put that email aside and focus on them because that's my priorities. And by doing that, and adopting that pattern and that you know mentality, I was able to create more balance in my life and be much more happier. Hmm. And, and probably be a better decision maker. Oh, in much terms better. Of, yeah. Much, yeah. Much clearer about making decisions about, you know, business and work and, and growing and, hmm. um, but you know, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's getting better now, but it's very, it was very difficult, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago to, to bring the two together. Mm. To, to think that they could mesh together uh, because you really felt like, you know, if I'm going to work, you know, I've got to work hard, you know, I've got to work yeah. hard. So I got to focus all my attention on work. If I want to create, get this brass ring and, and, and make it big, then I, I that's what I got to focus all my attention on. And, and I believe that, that you can have both. I believe you can still be successful and, and, mm. and have balance in your life and have a much stress, much less stress in your life, of course. And, by doing that, because you feel good about yourself. You feel good that, you know, you're healthy, you're stronger. You feel good that you gave your attention to your family. Yeah. And, and there's always, it seems like there's always time for work. And there's a it's, famous saying, yeah. right? There's a famous saying, no one on their deathbed looks back and, and says, <laughs> God, I wish I spent more time at work. Right. So true. So true. <laughs> and I can, I can relate to what you're saying. Now, I, I had a question about the prioritizing because I can, I, I, I sense in my own life and in my own business that I, I've thought that way. And, you know, I've thought for me personally, it's like God and then love, love myself and love those around me. And then the rest will kind of fall into place. And I've had days, Kent, where that just works swimmingly. And then there's other days where <laughs> those distractions sweep in and it's like, okay, well, like this needs to get done right now. So even though that's not at the top of my priority list, I'm going to go kind of do this thing right now and suddenly that starts snowballing and kind of takes over and so my question for you about like that prioritizing is was that a work in pro in in progress for you and like how did you remain on task like how did you keep those priorities at the forefront of your every day it's it's a daily practice and mm. it, it really is it's you know what it's it's like meditation too Mm. And it's, it's a daily practice. It's like, if you, you know, if you, 
if you want to lose weight and you go on a diet, you can't go on the diet for two days and then go off it for three days. Yeah. You've got to stay on it. Stay, stay regular, consistent, and persistent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to, you know, get stronger, you go to the gym every day or you work out or you exercise. And you can't just exercise for an hour a week. You got to exercise right. every day, right? And you yeah. do it consistently and repeat repetitively. And it's that repetitiveness and the consistency that starts rewiring your brain to make it a priority and your your, your focus changes, your, your attention mm -hmm. changes. And your brain starts making things work and manifesting things in your life so that it does fall in place for you. Right. Uh, I have a funny story about when I first started learning to meditate, one of the things that I would do in the morning is I would meditate about, okay, so I would meditate a positive attitude on it. Like how's my future day going to look like? And I, the morning's going to be great. And my, my the kids will be, will get along great. And, and nobody will be rushing and screaming to get out the door and <laughs> everything will be calm and peaceful. <laughs> and then I go upstairs after meditating and then everybody, all hell's broken loose. Right. Like, hell's well, kitchen is upstairs. <laughs> So it, it doesn't, it does, it's the, the, the God or the universe doesn't answer us, you know, like when we want it to answer us, right. answers us you know, what's best for us yeah. and the timeline and, and, you know, it manifests when it's best for us and, you know, mm -hmm. when it's best for our lives overall in general, it's not on our timeline. Right. Uh, the goal and actually was that a test it. from God, the universe, yeah. however, <laughs> and you know, you can, because you, truly how, how, how grounded mode, are you? <laughs> you can go on your reaction mode, right? And your normal reaction mode, which is to get upset and angry and all that, or you can just laugh about it yeah. and go, yeah. okay, joke's on me. I get it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then when you have that attitude, don't you find it kind of passes by quicker and doesn't affect the rest of your day as much? It's like water off a duck's back. It's like yeah. it, just, it hits you and falls right off rather than carrying those negative emotion, emotions with you throughout the day. Yeah. And whether you, you could carry them with you to work and all of a sudden uh, a coworker or, or, you know, a peer, you know, you get upset about, or, or, you know, you take something personal that they say when normally mm -hmm. you wouldn't, because you're not in that, you're not carrying that negative emotion with you forward. Yeah. And that's a conscious choice. And I love how you said practice and, um, it starts with awareness though. Be aware of your reactions and your responses and start to catch them sooner. I don't think anybody's going to be perfect at it. So it's all about leaning into the process of the practice. And then it becomes a little bit more automatic. As long as you're doing it every day, it's inevitable that automaticity will start to pick up and it, you'll catch those thoughts quicker. You can change those responses sooner. Exactly. And then you can change the trajectory of your day and your experience. You know, we've talked a lot about missed opportunities. If you're too distracted or your blinders are on too tight, um, that's when that happens. It's when you're in that reaction mode and go, 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 go. Yeah. You got to take a break. I, it's really easy for me. I've got one of those personalities where going full steam ahead, all or nothing kind of personalities. And I can get really into that. But with conscious awareness and leaning into these modalities, like you're talking about, you know, the key gong, the meditation, the mindfulness, um, doing these practices and having guided mentorship. That's why I love that you stepped into this and you're going to help people with it um, and help them develop these practices and integrate them into their lives. But with the more practice, the more awareness comes, the more peace comes. And what I've been practicing lately is um, starting the day to enjoy, just must start enjoy. So if I wake up, I had a funky sleep or something, look for something that I can lean on that's really positive in my life. And start the day from that energy so I can bring in more of that um, type of energy throughout yeah. the day and attract it. And so I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, a little bit to, you know, you mentioned selling your company. We kind of went really past, fast past that. But that is that is a massive moment because um, a lot of people tend to have their identity wrapped up in their business. And there's like, there's a morning, a morning and a celebration when you transition. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that process was like for you? Yeah, sure. It, it was, um, you know, when we started our company in 2001, it was me and my partner and we literally just put each of us put $25,000 in a bank account and we had one television show and we had a, our purpose was to create shows that we were passionate about. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have a business plan thought out of and but we knew that we were talented. We knew that, you know, he was a writer, producer, I was a director, producer. And we knew that we had something to give and that when we, we had done really good, been very fortunate to produce or direct good shows or shows that we were proud of, quality shows and execute them and execute on the idea. And so that was our goal in the beginning. And, and you know, we, with that goal in mind, we were very fortunate to get, you know, a lot of great opportunities that arose out of that. We worked really hard, long, long hours to build the company 
over the years, we had our shares of overcoming adversity um, about six years into five, yeah, six years into the production, we had done a, a show where one of our uh, employees had miscalculated the budget to the tune of a million and a half dollars. We were over Ooh. budget and the network wasn't going to pay us that money back. Yeah. But not only did he do it on one show, he did it on two shows. Yeah. So it was $3 million. We were all of a sudden in debt. <sighs> and, and it was like, well, what do we do? So yeah. we came up with a plan. We organized a plan to get some, some money to influx into the company. Most production companies, independent production companies would have gone under at that time, right. but we yeah. were determined to rise above it and make it, make it through. Mm -hmm. And we did, wow. we overcame it. And, uh, and we learned a big lesson from it. And, you know, it's something that's really interesting about business. And, and I think this crosses all genres of business. Yeah. You know, there, there's something about failure, the, the up and downs and the failure part that, that can make you stronger and, and create more success mm -hmm. by being resilient, by being, you know, dealing with the adversities and overcoming the obstacles. It makes yeah. you stronger, more resilient, like I said, but, but I didn't know that we would become more successful or even bigger. Uh, so when 2011 came and, and we had been approached by some different companies to buy our company, um, and we were entertaining different offers. And when we finally sold the company, um, like you said, there was this kind of like mourning of like something we had built was now, you know, not ours anymore. We now, you know, and, and every time anybody that has done an earn out or sold a company and had an earn out knows about, you know, you have to work for a certain period of years and before you you get your, you know, all your money and everything and before you can actually move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so there was this period of time after we sold it where we never were working for someone else, right. and not just working for ourselves anymore. And that was not great. That wasn't not, you know, because now you're working for a big corporation or a private equity firm or whoever, you know, is controlling, pulling the strings and controlling the, you know, the purse strings and everything is now judged on margins. And mm -hmm. everything is not judged on how is this oh. a good show to do? Is this a creative show to do? Is this something that we want to do? It's like, yeah. pump it out, get the, get the shows out. Come on. We have to make, we have to get our margins up. We've got to make more money. We, it's like, and so it, it became a factory of, of producing shows. Uh, I'm not saying all of the shows were that way. And, and there was a lot of good that we still did, but it was, uh, it was, it was a bit disheartening for me and it was, it was tough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I struggled well, with it. And as a fellow creative, I can, like, that pains me to hear, like, that would be extremely hard, I think, for many, you know, entrepreneurs or creative people that had the creative say in the business, and then you just kind of have to, <laughs> to go along with what's going on. How many years was that, Ken? That so I stayed that? on for six years. Wow, uh, that is not a short time. amount of time. I no. committed to five, and I stayed for six, wow. and, and it was, but it, and, it was, uh, you know, I just, you know, I did my time. Yeah. yeah. And, but, I, but I also struggled during that time too. And, and you know, I'm the kind of person that when I'm not happy, I, I tend to become, uh, I get, I pull inside and I become withdrawn and I, and I, and I get a little self-destructive. And, mm. you know, I, um, you know, was, uh, you know, I was really, you know, struggling during that time. And that was, you know, same at the same time that I was really, really spending a lot of time and energy on, you know, going to webinars and, and seminars and, and meeting with, you know, mentors and teachers and, and, and studying and reading everything I could about, you know, mindfulness, meditation, you know, you know, personal growth, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, finding your purpose and, you know, and all, all these things that, you know, would help me end up where I am today mm -hmm. uh, in a much happier place. And, and it was, you know, it was just so not about the money. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, and as anybody that knows that sold their company, you know, you don't get that number. That's the number that they put in the press, you know, cause then, then there's, you know, the part, you know, the partners split it, but before the partners split it, the lawyers and the business managers and all the people, and then the government takes their money. So, you know, if, if you're left with 38% of it and you're lucky, so, right. but, uh, but, I, but I, I always, I always want to make that clear because everybody goes, Oh my God, Oh my God. You know, you could buy an Island now. No, not really. <laughs> Technically no. <laughs> or a very small island, like an atoll, maybe an atoll off of something. But <laughs> um, can I can I talk about that a little bit? You mentioned something about you know how you when 
that's how you manage stress and whatnot was to go in and you become withdrawn and you did go seeking on your own, which is really great. But what came up for me um, as someone who's dealt with a lot of grief before, and then I've had a lot of friends who have reached out to ask me for advice with their withdrawn partners because they don't know how to reach them. They want to be helpful. They want to, um, it's really tough watching somebody that you love go through something and you just don't know how to reach out in the best way or how to support them best. Um, what advice could you offer, insight could you offer for people? Like, what did your, what did your wife do? Like, what in that situation, what was helpful? What could somebody do that's in the environment um, to just sure. to bless you with and grace you with having that space and respect that and also know that what they're doing is helpful? I think that every situation is different. And, um, and I think it's for some people, it's, it's their spouse. For some people, it's a, you know, a relative. Um, for some people, you know, it's, it's, it's seeking advice from, you know, therapy or, you know, a coach or someone finding someone that, you know, um, for me, my wife didn't understand what I was going through. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't the ideal person. Uh, I found someone that had gone through something similar to me. Um, who actually was a yoga teacher. He had been, then he became a yoga teacher, but and he was a yoga teacher when I met him yeah. and, and he helped me find more clarity. Mm. So I think for everybody, it's individuals. Just find someone that can relate to you, mm -hmm. doesn't judge you mm -hmm. and, and, but doesn't support your bullshit either. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, because we, we, we all, you know, we all, you know, try and hide behind our bullshit sometimes. So, yeah. um, yeah. so it's the person that keeps you real. Um, and for me, it was, the, it was that I found a person that, that was able to do that and, and help me really, you know, figure out what it was that was, what, what the, what the, what was driving the negative emotions what was keeping me trapped, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of it I, I've found in, in the research that I've done is, you know, it's really simple. It comes back to our parents. A, mm -hmm. a lot of it is just stuff that's so suppressed, so pushed back. And it doesn't have to be something like, you know, abusive either. It yeah, could right. just be, you know, um, a bad situation at home, you know, where it wasn't mm -hmm. comfortable or where you weren't made to feel good. Parents, you know, par as, par as a parent now, I know that it's not always easy. But yeah. we don't, and we're getting For sure. about it. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't always know what our, how our words affect our kids or how our actions affect our kids. Mm -hmm. We become unconscious in the moment. We say something or we do something and we don't realize the effect it has on the kids. And, mm -hmm. and what I, through all my work, internal work is I realized that there was some stuff I was holding on to, and I needed to release. I needed to forgive. I needed to let go of the past that was still controlling me in the present and into the future so that I could move forward. So important, especially when we're working these businesses, we're creating a life to be able to give back to our families in a meaningful way. But, you know, here's a situation where you drill yourself so hard to find whatever success is to you. Um, you know, not you in particular, but you as a general whole, that your family ends up suffering as a result of it, right? So really, I love how you just really reinforce and cement in priorities. Like if your family is your priority, then you need to make that your priority. What does that really look like with your work and giving yourself permission to pay attention to that? How are you going to make that work in your day and put the processes in place and get the supports in place to help you figure out what that recipe is for you? And when it doesn't work out, because it's not always going to work out, um, how you're going to be able to handle handle that and move forward and feel really good about it so that your family is supported. Because yeah, we don't we don't know the impact that we're going to have, but you know, we're all just doing our best. And so I love that. How can people get in touch with you if they wanted to, um, to explore mindfulness with you and yoga and yeah. Um, but before I give you that information, yeah. I want to go back for one second, because I yeah. want to touch on something that you brought up, Charlene, which was about yeah. awareness yeah. and, and opportunity. Yeah. And when we're trapped in a negative emotion, yeah. when we lose our awareness of it, you know, Meditation is a great way to do it. Mindfulness is a great way to do it. There's, there's lots of yoga is a great way to, to do it. Yeah. But the practice in that, what it does is, you know, like you were saying before, is the more you practice that, the more the distance between the act that you do or the word that you say, mm -hmm. and you recognize and becoming aware of it, it shortens. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. It shortens and shortens and shortens. And what I've learned pers in my personal life is, and this is through my meditation practice, that mm -hmm. that gap gets so small that you actually can get in front of it. Mm. Wow. So that you don't even get to the point of reacting because you, you already know, your brain's been rewired now to know, wait, no, we're not going to go there. Wow. We're, wow. We've, seen this, we've seen this movie before. We don't want to be in it, right? So and, and that's the beauty of being aware. That's when you really know you're being aware in your present moment. And the key that you were saying about opportunities is when you're in that negative state, you, you, the doors, the windows are all closed to opportunities because yeah. you're not in the operating in the system. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about being in high beta waves. Mm -hmm. and when you're in high mm -hmm. beta waves, that's when you're in these negative, you know, the resentful, the, you know, distrust, anger, fear, all these emotions are, and, and that you, nothing can happen out of that. No opportunities yeah. can be presented in that state. You've got to become more calm. You've got to be aware. You've got to be in a peaceful state for opportunities to appear. You won't even see the opportunities if they slap you in the face if you're in that kind of a negative emotion. So when you become aware and you become present, the opportunities appear for you like you've never even noticed before. And doors and windows are opening left and right. So, oh, so if you want to know more about me, um, yeah. liveyourpurpose.com. That's L-I-V-E-U-R, purpose. I have my hat. Oh, here's my hat. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Live love it liveyourpurpose.com is my website i also have a live your purpose facebook group and uh, uh linkedin as well yeah. you can find it there and at kent weed on instagram where i do uh, gratitude moments i'm a big believer in, in gratitude i'm writing a book about gratitude right now but i like your practice shirley and i start every day with waking up with what am i grateful for mm -hmm. so that i jump out of bed being in the right frame of mind the right energy like you were talking about yeah so that you know you when you operate, your gratitude and suffering can't exist in the same space. They can't. You can't be angry and you can't be ha happy at the same time. So why not be happy? Why not create gratitude in your life? And we have, you know, there's millions of things we can be grateful for every day. So yeah, uh, and choose to do it and plan it and schedule it. Oh in. my gosh! Yeah, you know? yeah. Why, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it will change your life. It really will change your life. This, I'm writing just a little ebook about gratitude first and before my other book, but. But um, it, it, it's so simple to do. It's one of the key elements of my course, Taming Your Monkey Mind, yeah. which is on mastermind.com. And you can also access it through liveyourpurpose.com. And mm -hmm. it's a six module course, but gratitude is one of the key elements. And it's, the, it's not just the meditation, learning to meditate. And I've devised a meditation practice for busy, busy people, especially executives and you know, entrepreneurs, that's 10 minutes a day, but can still give you the benefits uh, because of these practices that are implemented throughout the day, compassion practices and mindful um, gratitude practices that are really easy to do. And um, so that's, you know, because I was a busy executive too. So I know what that's like. And um, I know that, you know, that's the number one complaint I used to get from all my, you know, peers is like, I don't have time. You know, ten, yeah. I go. So yeah. I just had it the other day with a friend of mine who's like a hedge fund, you know, person. And then there's like, I go 10 minutes. You don't have 10 minutes. Come on. Right. You yeah. Ten minutes to brush your hair. Come on. Well, and if you have it queued up and ready to go, it's awesome. You know what I found really beneficial. Um, I could always up my meditation practice. I, I do do it. I still find I'm very distracted with my thoughts, very busy brain. Um, so it is really a practice. It's not a comfortable practice for me, but I do lean into it. And there was one I noticed when I was working in childcare, the supervisor of a child care at the military base, super busy. And I'm a single mom as well. So I would go from the child care and go right away to pick up my daughter, who is like literally two minutes away. And then boom, she's excited to see me full of energy. And I'm like, ah. So what I started to do, because I get mad at her and I don't want to get mad at her, but it was like too much. I just couldn't carry anymore. I'd already been carrying the load for everybody else all day. The management role of it all, to jump into my car and going right away. And I wasn't giving myself permission to pause. And I uh, started looking for transition meditations and I couldn't have it long because I needed to get her and then move on to activities. Yeah. But I found that five minute practice. It was one for teachers. I could only find one at the time. Um, transition meditation, just to stop and give myself that opportunity to breathe and reconnect and center. Yeah. Then I showed up and I was more responsive to my daughter. Now I could be there and go, I'm excited to hear you see you too. Tell me about your day because she's oh, always dude. excited about something. And like, then that brings me more joy because I get to, and that's what I always loved about childcare and children is when you're present with the man, they really help you see through life through a different lens. Everything's exciting. Everything's refreshing. Everything's new. And it's just 
if you can just sink into that for a minute, man, it's really life-giving. It can give you a second win for the day when you can lean into that. So transition meditations were helpful. What kind yeah. of meditation do you enjoy? Are you a transcendental meditation kind of guy or what are you no, into? I, I, um, I, I do my meditation um, uh, in the morning because it's really fast and easy, but I'm, I'm very much into Joe Dispenza right now Love him. and doing a lot more um, longer, deeper meditations right now as far as manifesting things in my life and creating from you know, um, from the, the field and from, you know, and from the universe and kind of getting in touch with kind of more, you know, other dimensions and stuff. So it's something I'm explore, exploring with and experimenting with it right now. You know, you mentioned that that's transition meditations on my website, liveyourpurpose.com. Mm -hmm. um, there's a two minute meditation that for, that's for free for people. That's just does exactly what you said to help just yeah. stop what you're doing for a moment and just, just center you and just realign everything where you are and just, put you on this it's a good one to, for people to do when they need to get ready for you know being in the better state than they, they are or to deal with some st stress that's get them out of there just take them yeah out of what they're doing right for or it, to even just build that into your day right like i'm sitting here listening and i'm thinking like i have a gratitude practice every morning and then i get on with my day but it's sort of like become another tick in the box yeah. where i get that done in the morning and it is really effective um but now I believe it's the ne it's next step for me where it's to trickle that in throughout the day instead mm. of ju it just being an isolated that's uh, moment. That's exactly yeah. it. And to your point, uh, one of the one of the gratitude practices or mindfulness gratitude practices that's part of the course that I have is is does does exactly what you're saying. Mm. And it's 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 just called a gratitude stone, and it's like a little stone you carry. And oh. I actually use this. This this is a heart that my daughter gave me, and mm. so I keep this in my pocket. And and what happens is. You, whenever you touch it, you're, you're, you, it's a, like yes. a trigger. It's a trigger that says, oh, what am I grateful for right now? And you, yeah. and then it snaps you back into reality because yeah. you know, the other stuff is not real most of the time. It's stuff that yeah. you're thinking, worrying about from the past or anxious about in the future, right? So yes. we're not living yes. in the moment, which is the problem that we're, we're facing. So yeah. this snaps you back to the present and, and it can help keep that feeling all the way through the day and trigger, you know, the little trickles of stuff. So that's just one little practice that keeps your meditation going throughout the day. That's why the 10 minutes works. You yes. don't have to do hours because the 10 minutes combined with these little things throughout the day helps cement it. Yeah. That's really good for families too. So not only adults, but children, exactly. give this to your children. Children are dealing with an incredible amount of anxiety yeah. um, right now. There's been a lot of change in the world. They're watching their families go through change and loss and whatnot. And everybody's just trying to navigate this new world. We got, uh, thrown into over the past couple of years so yeah why don't you and what a special project that would be as a family to go and pick out your special stones together so now it's cementing with a beautiful memory as well of connectedness you know yeah i did this for a school in singapore about 300 kids a couple months ago and, ah. and they all have their own gratitude stones now and they all wrote me oh. letters and and did a whole picture portfolio of all of them with their and it was one of the things that re really resonated with them ah. and they painted them like you said they made it an, a project and you yeah. know through their own word in there and their own flowers or colors or rainbows or whatever they did. Yeah. That's oh. it. Never too young, never too old to be grateful. Hey, <laughs> exactly that. that's awesome. Well, we end each episode, Kent, with some rapid fire questions for okay. our audience to get to know you a little bit more and your character and personality. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. What's your favorite drink? Uh, club soda. Per yeah. Sparkling water. Yes. I'm with you. Uh, if you were a DJ, what would your DJ name be? Uh, um, um, weed song. Oh. I was thinking DJ meditate. <laughs> uh, what do you have any hidden talents? I, um, I'm a surfer. I play guitar. I play oh. guitar. Oh, what do you like to play? Favorite song to play? Right now, it's um, I'm playing the uh, Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper song. Oh, look I at you! I gotta song. hear this sometime. Mm -hmm. So I just that's what I'm learning because my wife loves the song, so I taught myself how to play that. That's beautiful. The Beatles is my go-to. Mm. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Uh, what is the silliest invention you've ever heard of? The silliest invention I've ever heard of. <laughs> Um, a fan, a, a fan for your iPhone. <laughs> that is. Heat in the sun. 
<laughs> your perfect vacation getaway spot. Oh, well, it has to be near the ocean. Yes. Um, probably somewhere in the Caribbean. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Um, what is the best advice you've ever received? Uh, it was from my uncle um, a few years back when I was struggling and he said, um, life is about balance and creating balance. Mm. I think that one, that right, that's a, you know, first one that popped up. So yeah, must be right. And, you know, I, I just had this image pop into my head. My kids have like a, a little balance where you can, you know, weigh different things to oh. see how, you know, that's how balance. heavy things are or whatever, like an actual balance. And so, um, it's rare that it's at an equilibrium, right? Like it's kind of always going like this. Oh. And so I've learned through that little toy of theirs about life's balance, where it's sort of, you know, it, it it's never going to be perfect. It's, but it's the up and down and it's the, oh. you know, it's finding the equilibrium in that kind of way in different of different things. So oh, very good point. And like Charlene said, you know, it's about awareness too, knowing when you're yeah. out of balance in one area, it's like the wheel of life, right? It's like, yeah. sometimes you're going to be a little out of balance on, on you know, in this area, but you, you know, you make adjustments and oh. you make corrections, oh. you know, and no plane flies from straight from LA to New York. It's always <laughs> making corrections, right? It's all so. Well, it goes and it goes with surfing too. You're a surfer. You don't just get out there and you're like, boom, on the board, you're just rocking it, <laughs> catching this big wave and going to stay stable and grounded. You're not, you're going to get knocked over a number of times and yep. it's going to wear you out from time to time. But man, if you catch the right wave at the right time, at the right angle, at the right time of day, life can be pretty beautiful. Yeah, it's glorious. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's been a thank blessing you. and an honor to have you on the show and for well, taking us on. And yeah, you guys, liveyourpurpose.com. Go check it out. We're stronger together. We go further faster. Get in communities with people who actually can help you get over yourself and step into your calling. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us.